morning. Can you hear me? We're good? Okay. Welcome. Welcome each and every one of you this morning. God bless you each for uh, uh, persevering and uh, making it out this morning. We want to take a minute and welcome some new folks to our congregation. We have a family that moved from Brampton, and uh, I want you to give a good, warm, Belleville, friendly city welcome to Fraser, Mary Hayward, their daughter Sam, and she's got her boyfriend Chris this morning. So, Belleville. So it's wonderful to be growing during these COVID times. So make each other welcome and uh, share your cares and concerns and let us grow together as a family in Jesus Christ. A little bit of an update, Norm McWaters still is in hospital in BGH. It looks like he's going to be recovering for a while there. He seems in good spirits, but continue to reach out to Norm and uh, support him as you can. I just want to thank the Meals on Wheels gang. Uh, Barb Cater is our new coordinator. She's taken over from Sylvianne Barsley, who was promoted to glory suddenly this spring. And Barb has taken over, and the Meals on Wheels team have one more tomorrow morning for the season. But if you're interested in volunteering and getting involved when we go out in April, just talk to Barb. and. Uh, let her know that you're interested on being a Meals on Wheels volunteer. We have mission board meeting on Thursday night at, at 6.30, so just a reminder to that group. These are the announcements for this morning. God bless you each as we worship together. I'm not going to make the same mistake that I did last week and blame people at the back because I couldn't be heard. Nice to see you this morning. God bless you. Thanks for coming out on this uh, beautiful fall day. Just a couple of verses from Scripture to, uh, uh, to lay the foundation of what's going to be happening this morning. And in the next couple of weeks, we're starting a new sermon series called More Than Survivors, which I think is very appropriate for what we've been going through and for uh, maybe the near future as well. So a couple of verses from Hebrews chapter 11, uh, selected verses. Hebrews chapter 11. Now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commanded for. Verse 6. And without faith it is impossible to please God, because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. By faith, Abraham, when called to a place to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. By faith, he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations, whose architect and builder is God. By faith, Abraham, even though he was past age and Sarah herself was barren, was enabled to become a father because he considered him faithful who had made the promise. And so from this one man, and he as good as dead, came descendants as numerous as stars in the sky and as countless as sand on the seashore. All these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance. And they admitted that they were aliens and strangers on earth. People who say such things show that they are looking for a country of their own. If they had been thinking of the country they had left, they would have had opportunity to return. Instead, they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. And then verses 32 to 34. And what more shall I say? I do not have time to tell you about Gideon and Barak and Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and the prophets, 
who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, and gained what was promised, who shut the mouths of lions, quenched the fury of the flames, and escaped the edge of the sword, whose weakness was turned to strength, and who became powerful in battle and routed foreign army, armies. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and mountains and in caves and holes in the ground. These were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised, because God had planned something better for us, so that only together with us would they be made perfect. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. What great words to begin our service this morning. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Now you know that uh, it's not permissible for us as a congregation to sing. So as we suggested last week, if you know the melody, you can at least come along and you can uh, observe the words on the screen. Norma's going to come and actually sing the song for us, but I encourage you to pay attention to the words because the words of this song, uh, while the melody is going to be familiar to you, the words will not be familiar to you, but they speak specifically about the theme of our messages for the next number of weeks. The fact that we are actually on a journey. We're sojourners here on earth. And so there's a lot of uh, wealth to the words that you'll read on the screen. So please pay attention to that. And Norma's going to come and sing, and the band is going to help us as uh, as an accompaniment. Good morning. I uh, have been looking with anticipation when I heard that uh, Majors Catherine and we were going to be talking about surviving. And I, I'm going to say a personal thing, and I hope the others as well. Many of you know I had cancer. And I became called a survivor. And I didn't like the word survivor. I'm much appreciated. I'm an overcomer. And that's what we do. We have by faith and we survive. And we do overcome. We do get through things. But I want us to be overcomers in Christ. And this morning, that's the verse in 1 John 4 and 4 said, Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them. Because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And we're going to find that out in all these men and that uh, the Major's going to be talking about how they survived and became overcomers in Christ. So this morning, the words say, we are more than just survivors. We are thriving as we climb toward the summit of a journey charted by the Lord's design. Daily choices ease the burden as we eye the prize ahead, always looking unto Jesus. Grace to face the fears we, uh, we dread. And truly, we can put our faith and our trust in our Lord Jesus, who loves us and will bring us through victorious and as overcomers. Survive, we will, and we will do it, but we will overcome too. So we're going to sing the first verse with the band leading, and um, I'm going to take the, the hand from one on the way to start, okay? It goes to joyful, joyful, we adore thee, okay? Oh.
promise while we wait, O oh Lord, for you, in this hour we bow before you. <coughs> oh Lord, our God, to you. I'd love to hear some more humming. I think you forgot your first singing lesson. So back on the hum we go, okay? <laughs>
kids, because how can you compete with that? <laughs> uh, kind of as a joking around this morning before we came out, I noticed that the three boys were on to do things, and I volunteered to be, well, I didn't volunteer. I offered to be their uh, agent or a security guard, whatever they need when they become famous, because they will. And uh, I'm trying to get a piece of that action, so <laughs> hopefully it works out that way. Uh, we're only going to be part of my testimony. I need to remember three things. Children, those who are not, uh, grow up, those who haven't grown up in the earth, and God in the, in the hard times. Okay, so what's the first one? Children. So Will's going to be sorry that he gave me this uh, microphone, because for 30 years I was a teacher, and one of the things they uh, did for me in school was never let me have a microphone. Because uh, they were afraid in the assemblies that I would carry on too much, which I did. Uh, you know, like, there's lots of things you can do. So, kids, this is for you because who wants to hear an adult going oh, blah, 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 there's no fun. So, this part's for you. So, I used to do funny things with the microphone. So, for example, uh, sound effects. One of my favorite was, you know, here's a horse coming, going over a covered bridge and then taking off. So I'd do that. The other one was you'd get the microphone <coughs> and you hear it and it'd get really loud and they would be upset with that. Uh, and then the third one, which I really had fun with, is with the uh, sound people. And I would start talking and you'd and you get it and yeah, and, and ooh, what's wrong with the microphone? Yeah. So anyway, uh, that was the part for you guys, the kids. That was my fun. Uh, what's the next one? Very good. <laughs> Okay, so I really enjoyed uh, listening to folks who have been giving their testimonies in the last few weeks. Uh, and a lot of them did not grow up in the army. So it was kind of interesting to hear their stories and, you know, where, where they came from. And I always thought as a kid when I was, so I got saved when I was eight years old. So I always thought as a kid I never had a great testimony because, eh, you know, I wasn't on drugs, I didn't smoke, I didn't drink. Wasn't a bad guy, I didn't cause any trouble. So what would I have to say? And I guess the good important part was someone said to me, well, you can tell them that God kept you away from all of that. So I thought that was, that was a pretty good testimony in itself. Now for those of you who had never grew up near me, here's what it was like. Uh, it was church, and then church, 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 and church. I was probably in the building more than the officer was, because uh, Sunday you had directory, and then you had the service, Sunday school, another service. That was Sunday. Uh, Monday, uh, there would be junior soldiers. Tuesday, uh, singing company. Wednesday, YP band. Thursday, it goes on and on. Every night there was something going on, so I spent my life growing up in the church where most people probably didn't. So that's one something different about Salvation Army, uh, growing up in the Army. And I, I, I must say, I really have nothing bad to say about it because I'm here and I'm, I'm quite happy in my life and I'm quite happy for what God has done for me. So there used to be a, a, a benediction that we used to sing in the army and I, used, I thought it was funny at the time when we would sing it because I never quite understood it first, but it was just three simple lines. It was praise God I'm saved, praise God I'm saved, all's well. All's well, he sets me free. And there's an action to that, right? So, you know, I praise God, I'm saved, because I'm, when you said all's well, you raised the one hand, all's well, the other hand came up and then you floated down like this and then you clapped your hands. Uh, so I thought, like, why are we clapping our hands? I guess we clap our hands for God setting us free. Well, in about nine years ago now, November 2011, all wasn't well. Couldn't understand what was going on in my life. I'm, I'm always the kind of person that could figure out things, uh, knew what was going on, I could do this. If something came up, okay, I know how to get around this. But in 2011, I couldn't figure this out. As a matter of fact, I kept thinking, what's going on around with the people around me? My kids are driving me nuts, what's wrong with them? Uh, I was married for 20 years, what's wrong with my wife? Uh, you know, just a few things like this. But I found out that in actual fact, is what was wrong with me. Uh, I remember com coming to church on the Sunday morning, and we sang the song, uh, Open My Eyes, Lord, I Want to See Jesus. And I couldn't sing it. 
uh, my heart got heavy. I actually filled up. And I remember going forward and I knelt at the altar, just asking God, like, like what's going on? I can't figure this out. Monday morning when I went back to work, I walked in and the vice principal said, how you doing, Brad? And uh, I just stood there and tears started rolling down my eyes. I remember just previous to that, every time, I, I mean, I love being a teacher, love my job. And I remember every morning my wife would say, Brad, are you okay? And I would sit on the bed, I would cry. I said, no, God, I don't want to go to work today. Never ever felt like that. Well, it turns out that when I went to the doctor finally, uh, he had diagnosed me with mild to medium depression. And I went, hmm, me depressed, not me. But it was. I, was, I had depression. I took three months off school, and during that time, uh, I felt guilty because I didn't feel like I was anything wrong with me as such, but, you know, I couldn't go, I wasn't going to work. Matter of fact, my youngest son enjoyed it because I kept driving him to school and picking him up every day. But then the quiet time would happen is when I would come home because my boys are not in the house, my wife's gone to work, and I'm sitting by myself in the house. So I remember feeling, when I was going through the situation, I remember that, you know, I was a teacher for 20 years, uh, you know, in the classroom, not afraid to stand up, not afraid to teach. And then all of a sudden I felt like I had no idea what I was doing. I had no confidence in myself. Felt like I didn't know how to teach a lesson. All that kind of stuff was just driving me crazy. So anyway, I was sat down this morning, and back a few years previous to that, I taught this, uh, taught this family. It was one good thing about teaching in the same school. You got to teach families. So I taught this family. The oldest boy was the same age as my oldest son. And then a few years later, I taught the younger son of this family. And he was one of these boys. It was French immersion. He didn't do well in French. He was carrying on all the time in class. Just, you know, people would say, what's wrong? He was fooling around, you know, wouldn't, wouldn't do any work, and stuff like that. So I always felt, figured, when someone was doing that, uh, maybe there's a problem. Maybe there's a learning disability or something. And of course, parents don't want to hear that their kid has a learning disability. But I remember sitting down with the mom and, you know, went through and tried to get the idea of getting him to move, probably go to a back to English program and so on. Mom said, no, no, it's not that problem. No. But anyway, when he went to grade eight, he finally left the school and uh, he went into the English program. Now, that being said, that one morning when I was sat down in my uh, in my basement, just, just thinking about what's going on. Uh, I opened up my email, and I had an email from this mom. This was a few years later. And I remember she had my email address because we would, my oldest son would hang out with her kid, and so, you know, we'd, we'd be going here, going there, whatever. So anyway, I, uh, I opened the email, and I started reading. And so, you know, dear Mr. Rideout, this is Yvonne, how are you? Uh, I was just thinking the other day, and I just thought that I would send you this email thanking you for what you did for my youngest son back in grade 7 when you suggested he should come out of French. We moved him to an English program, uh, and he's actually excelling right now because he discovered he had a learning disability, and he's actually doing really well in school. He's working towards a scholarship. Uh, you know, all, all these things that were, that were positive for this young couple. And I thought for the moment, there's God speaking in the tough times. I was at my lowest point in my life. Probably not as low as some other people had in their life, but the lowest point in my life. And I was sat there and I listened to that and I said, wow, you know, God needed me to hear that. So he, so he just sent that email out of the blue. The email arrived. And then I realized, you know what, I'm going to get through this. I'm going to feel better. And I know that God is there for me. Now, one of the things they always tell <laughs> when the old folks would do their testimonies, sometimes you could sit down and you could tell who was getting up and you could round off their testimony with them because they would say the same thing over and over. But, uh, and that was kind of fun sometimes. But uh, one of the things that most everybody would do was this. They'd always, before they sat down, is they would challenge the people who are listening. So I'll challenge you. Uh, no matter what the tough time is in your life, no matter where you are, and you might be feeling low, you might be feeling down, God will not leave you alone. And He didn't leave me alone, which I'm thankful for. And He can be a part of your life if you just accept Him, 
into your heart. So if you're struggling this morning, and you are a believer, then make sure that you ask God to continue to help you. If you're not a believer, then ask God to come into your heart. Because then not only will He help you, He will carry you through the tough times. God bless you. Thanks so much, Brian, for uh, sharing uh, something of your heart. I appreciate that. Um, now, during these times, we're not able to have Sunday school classes as we normally would, and children grow for that. So what we're going to do is we're going to have a three-minute children's time, and that's going to be on the screen. is Saul. Saul was a Pharisee who hated the followers of Jesus so much that he would hunt them down to be brought to trial in Jerusalem. And he would even seek to murder them. with every breath, and he was eager to kill the Lord's followers. So he went to the high priest. He asked him to write a letter to the Jews in Damascus that would allow him to arrest any Christians he found there. He wanted to bring them, both men and women, back to Jerusalem in chains. Now Saul went on his way, and as he came near Damascus, a light from heaven flashed around him, and he heard a voice that said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Saul cried out, Who are you, Lord? And the voice said, I am Jesus. Rise and go into the city, and you will be told what to do. So Saul got up, and he opened his eyes, but he couldn't see anything. So the men who were with Saul led him into the city. After three days, a man named Ananias came to Saul. He put his hands on Saul and immediately Saul could see again. And with that, Saul became a follower of Jesus. He became the very thing he had tried to hunt. And he immediately began telling people that Jesus is the Son of God. And he taught them about the mercy of God that he had received. And all who heard him were amazed. He then went by a new name, Paul, as he began preaching not just to the Jewish people, but to everyone, despite many difficulties like being imprisoned, shipwrecked, and narrowly escaping death multiple times, Paul continued to preach about Jesus. Paul said that he would do everything he could to save people and help them know God. And that's just what he did in order to reach people who would otherwise be unreached. And many came to know Jesus because of what Paul said. Paul taught many in his day through his letters, but even more have come to learn more about Jesus through the letters of Paul that can be read even to this day.
Uh, since we're talking about uh, sojourning and being, uh, being in a land that's not our own, um, I thought of uh, so many of us who had a background, and this is really feels loud. Are you, are you okay back there? It is loud? Okay, good. Um, well, not good, but okay, we can adjust it. That's good. All right, thank you. Um, so what I did is I dug out uh, something that I'd done a number of years ago. Ancestry.ca had a week where you could get something online for free. And so, uh, so I went online and I found my grandfather's landing certificate. He arrived in July of 1920. He was 19 years old, he'd come from Scotland, and as you see, what well, you can't see on there, but, but it, it really is real. It's a photocopy of a photocopy, so that's why it looks a bit blurry there. Um, but what you can notice there is at the very bottom, he signed his name, July 20th, 1920. Um, he arrived in Quebec, he took the train across. Um, his sister and brother-in-law had already been in BC, and uh, so he arrived with 50 pounds in his pocket, which is really an amazing sum. I was really surprised when it's about, today's currency might be about $2,000 Canadian. I thought, that's, that's pretty good. Now some of the other things that are a bit funny um, is it asks if he had ever spent any time in an in insane asylum, um, and also wanted to know where he'd come from, things that you'd never ask now, what is your religion? Um, but I thought, what an incredible, um, adventure this must have been for this 19-year-old man um, coming across the ocean, really not knowing very much about Canada at all, but just a, a new possibility, uh, a new chance at life. And as we look at the story of Abraham, I think maybe we might have sensed something about that, except that Abraham was uh, about 80, 90 years old when God said, I want you to move from your hometown and go on this new adventure, as it were, God spoke to Abraham and said, I want you to leave the old country of Chaldea. And he told him to pack for a journey that would take him across the desert that would last the rest of his life. Um, it speaks of the tenacity of this man, Abraham, and also his trust in God. Now Abraham, we have to remember, was just an ordinary man. He sinned, he blundered, but he had a passion for his relationship with God. And he did more than just survive, he thrived. What Abraham demonstrated was faith. Abraham left his home with an idea of what his journey would bring, but he found himself miles removed from what he expected. His new world was nothing like he'd ever known before. Perhaps that's why our Christian forebears identify so well with this life of Abraham. They saw in him their own story, severed roots, homesickness, death, adventure, insecurity, and yet a God who can be trusted and recognizable even when their destination proved different than imagined. In Abraham's life experience, they saw the validation of God's faithfulness and recognized that it really was possible not only to survive the adventure, but also to thrive. And I think that many in our congregation can attest to the pilgrimages of their own. Careers marked by forks in the road, or transitions in itineraries that they haven't counted on, others who have experienced unplanned changes in their life journey, and all along they thought they knew where they were going, and then all of a sudden, just like Dorothy, they realized we're not in Kansas anymore. Have you ever had that kind of an experience? Well, I know that Norna did. So Norna, this is unplanned, by the way. All right, she doesn't know I'm asking this. So come on and please stand by the mic for a second. Because uh, Catherine and I went on a trip with Norna and Jared and a number of other people that we knew to China about, was it two and a half or three and a half years ago? Three and a half years ago. Okay, so a little incident happened. Um, one afternoon, we were in a small Chinese town. I think there's only maybe about 11 million in that particular town. And there are other places that we went to were like 34, 35 million people. Can you imagine? No, you probably can't. But anyway, so we're in this uh, town of maybe 11 million. We've gone out one afternoon. We were, um, I remember visiting a museum, and then there was a really nice park area around. And then we got on the bus, and we got back to the hotel. And what happened, Norma? You didn't get on the bus. <laughs> I wasn't there. I just left in the smoke shop. Okay, um, can you, can you? Activate her mic. Sorry. Um, I think it was 33 million. 
Okay, all right. to tell you that. But uh, my pastor and his wife were in there, along with my, the acting course sergeant major. And uh, after we went to the silk shop, I was waiting around to make sure that I wasn't going to be late heading on the bus. And no, they weren't. They were still waiting. And so I went looking elsewhere. And when I came out, my pastor and his wife and the acting course sergeant major had gone bye-bye, and no one was left in this uh, store that nobody spoke English. And I thought, oh, Lord. And um, then I finally, I had difficulty trying to get a hold of anybody, I, cause, and I wasn't smart enough to look on my name badge to find out that the whole, that Puma, his number was on there to phone. In the end, another group uh, that, uh, that was going to China were there, and they got their leader to come and talk to me. In the end, they got a hold of Puma and said, you're missing somebody. And so he got on the phone and said, you go with this group. And I hadn't got a clue who they were, but I went. And uh, then when I was dropped off, I was supposed to meet uh, Puma at this museum. I couldn't find Puma. And it was in our, um, a museum, and I thought, oh my goodness. Finally, Puma came up to me and said, but the others have been to the museum. They've gone shopping. And I thought, do you want to stay at the museum by yourself? I'm going to pick you up later. And I said, no, I think I'm just going to go along with you whenever I find you and this other group. So I missed the museum. I missed the shopping, which was really kind of, really classy. And in the meantime, I, I met a lot of other people on this other, I'm not supposed to say this, am I? But I met a lot of other people on this other group. I passed people where nobody was supposed to beg in China who had no legs and no arms and were begging. And I thought, oh God, what am I going to do? Getting on a bus with you, I don't know. Where I am, I don't know. But I knew one thing. God was my Heavenly Father and he would not leave me. He would get me to the promised land of the promised <laughs> and to my pastors. And though they didn't miss me, I didn't let them forget it either. No, no, because she shows up for dinner and she said, thanks a lot. <laughs> and the last thing they asked, nor to hear, but yeah. God was faithful. God was faithful. You know. So how did it feel though? It must have been really uh, anxiety provoking to be in a country where you didn't speak the language, you didn't know your way around. I'm surprised that you even like looked on your name tag badge for that. I, I didn't rem even remember the name of the hotel. I don't either. Okay. I don't either. I, in fact, I kind of, that was where the um, feet, the COVID fever started. Mm. But you, know, you don't tell people that. <laughs> no, but I did. But we, you know, we were safe. But God was with me. I had every confidence that my heavenly Father was going to look after me mm. wherever I was, whatever. And we could add a little story to this, can't we? I don't know if I'm supposed to. We get to Montreal, we have 20 minutes to disembark and get onto a plane to get us to Ottawa, and my luggage doesn't come in time. And they've got, they're all on the plane, who's going by, and I'm left in Montreal. I don't speak French, I have a And I, I said, you just go, you go, I'm gonna be fine. And there I was left alone, but again, God was faithful. I just, you know, you don't get alone, and don't have the difficult times. And I, in the middle of the room, I know I'm not supposed to get into this, but my Heavenly Father cares for me. Mm, amen. My Heavenly Father cares for you, whatever your situation. And I am so confident that whatever it is, He is going to look after me because He knows the path I'm on and the path we take. And I'm going to be a survivor. And more mm. than that, I'm going to be an overcomer. And I apologize for butting in on your, your service. That's okay, I'll just cut out 10 minutes somewhere else. <laughs> But it's interesting to hear people's experience. Imagine yourself being in a land where you don't speak the language. Uh, you don't, in, in a sense, you don't know your destination. And there comes, as Nora has testified, the fact that I can trust God, even in a situation like this. As Christian believers, I think it's important for us to understand we are in exile. And what do you think of when you think of exile? We are sojourners in a strange land. A land which is ultimately not our homeland. In his letter to the Romans, Paul celebrates the sovereign hand of God and he's, who stirs the mixing bowl of our circumstances. And, and many of you will know the verse Romans 8 and 28. It's a favorite verse of many people. It's a favorite of all those who are waiting for their ship to come in. It's a favorite of those who fear that the ship that they see docking at their address might be the Titanic. It's a verse that some are clinging to because their love boat has given way to a lifeboat 
following the tidal wave of divorce. It's a passage of scripture that offers safe harbor when the gale force winds of grief have rendered their yacht not seaworthy. But we have to be careful in our understanding of that verse because as with many of the other promises in scripture, there's a conditional clause that we can so easily overlook. And we can be guilty of quoting this verse to people who are outside the boundaries of what this verse implies. Four very important words. You see it up on the screen. Those who love him. God works for the good of those who love him. It's right in the middle there on the screen. The overwhelming truth in this short passage is enough to swell the sails of our vessel for a lifetime. Emphasized again and again is God's commitment to his people, and everything these few verses speak about refer to the benefits that are ours as God's people, because in the same chapter, of Romans chapter 8, it tells us God is for us. God gave his son for us. Jesus prays for us. God's love for us in Christ Jesus is emphasized again and again in this chapter of Romans 8. And when the apostle goes on to hypothesize some possible scenarios where God's willingness to champion our cause might be undermined, he said, who can separate us from the love of Christ? Can trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or COVID or danger or sword? That's the Radcliffe version, by the way. And then he proceeds to answer his rhetorical question with a resounding no. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us, for I'm convinced that nothing can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So we've heard it so often, but we've heard it here. Maybe do we hear it here? Do we understand it here? I'm convinced that nothing is able to separate us from God's love. No matter where we are in our exile journey, no matter the circumstances, no matter the detour, no matter the uncharted destination, we are more than conquerors. We're people of the promise. Don't forget the promise. What is the promise? God is for us. There is nothing that can separate us from the love of God. We are people of the promise. Catherine and I received a, um, a challenging devotional just this week. And it said something to the effect of, and I mean, many of you know the journey that we've been on, but it said something to the effect of, do we believe the promises of God? Do we sometimes cherry pick the promises of God? I'm, I'm willing to believe that God created the heavens and the earth. I'm willing to believe that God, you know, loves generically. But do we believe the promises of God? Roman, or pardon me, Hebrews 6 and 18 says, God cannot lie. And if God cannot lie, that means that we don't have the privilege of choosing what promises we're going to believe that he's going to live up to. Because if God cannot lie, then every promise is true. So we either have to come to the place in our theology where we say, I don't believe the promises of God. They're categorically not true. Or we come to the place where we say, every promise is true. And even though in my heart it's sometimes difficult to receive it or understand it or accept it, God's promises, as the Bible says, are yea and amen. Yes and it will happen. It is. Do we believe the promises of God? Now, as we go through the series, this sermon series in the next few weeks, we'll be looking at and learning from different people in a catalog of faith. But the reason why we're looking at these spiritual heroes is, in fact, not simply that they were just survivors, but they were thrivers. And all that the Bible informs us about as Christians is to help us live with the grace and strength Jesus Christ gives to us and empowers us so that we live more than just defeated lives, we're not, not just existing, we're thriving. I remember reading about David Livingston, who once addressed a group of students at Glasgow University. And he rose to speak and he bore on his body the marks of his African struggles. Years of repeated illnesses had left him gaunt and haggard. And his left arm that had been crushed by a lion hung limp at his side. And after describing some of the difficulties he had been through through the years, he said, would you like to have me tell you what supported me through the years of exile among people whose language I could not understand, who 
whose attitude towards me was always uncertain and often hostile. It was the words of Jesus, Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. And on these words I stake everything, and they never failed. God's promises are sure. Is God a liar? Or do we trust his promises? But if you know the Lord, he has gone on record to say that he will blend everything together, the bitter and the sweet of our lives, to create a meal that will not only nourish our life, but will sustain us as we accomplish the purposes of his overriding will. The Apostle Paul, when he writes these words, is not speaking from some ivory tower and pontificating. He's writing these powerful words from a prison cell. And he talks about thriving spiritually. As he's contemplating his own experiences, he said, he's been in prison, he's been flogged, he's been left for dead, he's been shi shipwrecked three times. Given the infamous Roman 39 lashes, everything imaginable. And how does he come across describing it? Well, to the church in Corinth, he put it this way. Hard pressed on every side, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, struck down, but not abandoned not destroy more than a survivor right and talk about a wealthy heritage you know I wouldn't take a million dollars in exchange for the security that these verses suggest are mine as a follower of Jesus when God touches our lives for good even then even though we aren't aware that he might be working we have every reason to believe that we will survive the storms that we find ourselves in maybe even feeling adrift at sea but we will survive our relational or vocational or even spiritual storms because God is faithful to his promises. I wonder how many of you ever watched or remember the TV series Survivor? Anybody? Okay, all right, a bit of a following here, good. Well, I remember a couple of years ago, Catherine and I were watching a late night um, talk show and uh, one of the guests on the talk show was a winner of a Survivor episode. He had been in Africa and the outback, and he had won a million, not just a million dollars, a million US. And so he was on this talk show, and the host was uh, talking to him about what he had experienced. And he'd just come back, and he was trying to figure out, what, what is he gonna do with a million dollars? That's a, that's a great question to ask yourself, isn't it? What would I do with a million dollars? But the interviewer um, said to him, so what significant life lesson did this uh, experience teach you? Hmm. And the guy drew a blank. He had nothing to say. The whole purpose for him in all of this was to get that million bucks and how he was going to spend it. He had drawn a blank. I sometimes wonder, the difference between surviving and thriving is what are the lessons that we're learning in the journey about ourselves, about our relationship with God, about our connection with others in the world around us. And sometimes I think we're, we're really acting and living out our life at a low level. We don't actually take the time to examine where we are. What is the God teaching me in this journey? What am I, am I applying the lessons that I'm learning? Am I just a survivor? Just a victim? Or is my plan to allow God's work in my life so that I become not just a survivor, but a thriver? If we were honest, when it comes to moving into uncharted waters of an unanticipated experience, we're all in the same boat. And that's why the example of Abraham and the others listed in the family tree of Red Registry of Hebrews 11 tends to awaken in us a slumbering faith. That's why Paul's personally validated confidence in God's purposeful involvement in our lives serves as a compass for us, those of us who have chosen to adventure in faith. And all of these examples remind us that hardship, change, suffering, surprise is part of this journey called life. But we have a trustworthy captain. 
I'm not sure how many of you know very much about the story of Johnny Erickson Tata. Johnny was a 17-year-old kid whose life changed dramatically one July afternoon when she dove into a shallow lake and she suffered a spinal cord fracture that left her paralyzed from the neck down. She didn't have the use of her hands, her legs, and she says that laying in her hospital bed, she tried desperately to make sense of this horrible event that had happened, and she begged friends to help her to commit suicide. She told them, slit my wrists, dump pills down my throat, anything to end my misery. In her testimony, she says she had so many questions. She believed in God, but she's angry with him. How could these circumstances be a demonstration of his love and power for her? Surely, he could have stopped her, this accident from happening. How can permanent, lifelong paralysis be a part of his loving plan for her life? And she said, unless I found the answers, I didn't see how this God could be worthy of my trust. Steve, who is a friend of Johnny's, came and he took her questions and he pointed her to Christ. And she writes, now I believe that God used my accident to turn a stubborn kid into a woman who would reflect patience, endurance, and a lively, optimistic hope of the heavenly glories above. She says, my wheelchair used to symbolize alienation and confinement, but God has changed its meaning because I've trusted in him. Now my wheelchair symbolizes, symbolizes independence. It's a choice I made, and one that anyone can make. Catherine and I had the privilege of hearing Johnny speak a number of years ago at a conference. She's an artist, she paints and draws with her mouth, as you see on the screen there. She's a singer, she's an author, has written a number of books. Johnny goes on to write, I've discovered many good things that have come, come from my disability. I used to think happiness was a Friday night date, a size 12 dress, and a future with Ethan Allen furniture and 2.5 children. Now I know better, she writes. What matters is love. I live with a heightened awareness that better things are coming. The good things in this life are only a foreshadowing of more glorious and grand things in heaven. And then she quotes the words of a song that she authored. And you see this, um, this picture up here. That's a drawing by Johnny. Do you notice what the sign says on, on the wheelchair? For sale. The words of the song capture the thrilling perspective that she's come to know in the years since her accident. And these are the lyrics. And I close with this this morning. I rejoice with him whose pain my Savior heals. And I weep with him, who still his anguish feels. But earthly joys and earthly tears are confined to earthly years. And greater good, the word of God reveals. In this life, we have a cross to bear. It's just a tiny part of Jesus' death that we can share. And one day I'll lay it down, because he's promised us a crown to which our suffering can never be compared. That's why heaven is nearer to me, and at times it is all I can see. Sweet music I hear coming down to my ear, and I know that it's playing for me, for I am Christ the Savior's own bride, and redeemed I shall stand by his side. He will say, shall we dance? And our endless romance will be worth all the tears I have cried. God's plan for you and I is not just to survive, but to thrive as we trust him and as he fulfills his promises in us. The song that I'm going to ask uh, Hannah and Holly to sing now uh, talks about how key it is to understand that, that God really is on our side and he holds us. Even in the difficult times and the difficult moments, God is still in charge and we entrust ourselves to his care. Thank you. 
responsive benediction. Uh, the leader is going to be our band members, and uh, then the rest of us, the people, will join in as we share together before a closing song. And I think you begin. Those who let go of self and hold on to Christ are given. Do you believe in this? With all our heart, forgiveness is God's free gift to be accepted by faith alone in Christ. Do you believe it? We do, with all our heart. Then your new name is set free. If God no longer accuses us, we will stop accusing ourselves. We will celebrate his love and sing his praises. Amen. And uh, the song that we conclude with, For I Know Whom I Have Believed, it, uh, it, it's a great song to clap to as we sing the chorus. Uh, the verses pose a question, I don't know why, or I don't know how, but the keystone of the song is found in the chorus, but I know him, I know whom I have believed, and uh, it's there that we have our anchor, um, our certain hope, our foundation, no matter what the questions, no matter the mysteries or the things that we don't understand. I know whom I have believed it, and he is able uh, to bring it all together until that day when Jesus Christ returns and we experience um, full revelation, no more mysteries, full redemption, the glories and the rewards of our Heavenly Father. Uh, we'll sing the first two verses. I think, Norna, are you going to come? I say we'll sing. What Norna will sing, as she does beautifully, and uh, we can worship and hum along if you'd like. First two verses. Stand. Give me some.
you for joining us this morning. And again, grateful thanks to uh, Nadine and all the wonderful regathering team and their other places. They will escort you uh, as you go and down the hallway and out the back door. God bless you. It's been good to gather. Thank you for the ministry of everyone. It's uh, encouraged my soul, and I pray it's done that for you as well.